Hi, I'm Peter Economy. I'm the leadership guy on Inc.com. I've written over 100 books and I've sold more than 3 million copies during the course of my career. Today we're going to talk about um, becoming a new manager, what you need to know, the habits you need to ingrain, the, the things that you have to do to become a great manager, which unfortunately many of us have never been trained how to do. Uh, in my book, Wait, I'm the Boss, I lay that all out for you and uh, stay tuned to hear more about that. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. Let me ask you, what do you need to do to up-level your leadership? Learning by osmosis is great if the person you're learning from is exceptionally good. However, learning by osmosis from a poor leader can be, as I'm sure you're aware, catastrophic, particularly if you're a new leader, because you likely don't have the experience to actually recognize bad leadership. But what if great leadership is not about the latest flavor of the month or some new theory, but rather about new leaders having a reference guide to build a rock solid foundation on. Well, stay tuned because that's exactly where we're going on today's show. I'm your host, Dove Barron, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that transforms everything by transforming meaning into action. You can find out more about me at DoveBaron.com. That's D O V. B-A-R-O-N.com. This episode of Leadership and Loyalty is brought to you in part by our other podcast, Curiosity Bites. Curiosity Bites is the answer to the question, how can we bring people together who completely disagree? This is exactly what your heart, your mind, and your soul have been craving. It's your chance to sit in on some real and often rather intense conversations about some of, with some of the world's most interesting people discussing some of the most interesting subjects. I'm talking about astronauts, neuroscientists, philosophers, holy people, quantum physicists, skeptics, multi-Grammy award-winning entertainers, entrepreneurs, and folks who you might even think you completely disagree with who are truly fascinating. Simply go to DoveBaron.com and find out how you can sign up for and sink your teeth into the delicious Curiosity Bites. As always, you can find both of those podcasts, this one and Curiosity Bites, on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or wherever it is that you tune into podcasts. And honestly, we always need your help in staying relevant. So please go over there, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And do us a favor, share it with others. If you're a regular listener, big thank you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. We're honored and grateful to be said by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. You can also listen to us on Google Home and Alexa by simply saying, play Dove Baron podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. A few years back, Gallup did some research that clearly showed that people don't leave their jobs. They leave what Gallup called managers from hell. <laughs> of course, we know that most people in leadership positions are in those positions for many years before they get any kind of substantive leadership training. Now, maybe you're saying, I, we don't have time to teach them to lead. Maybe you are a sort of throw them in at the deep end kind of organization. Well, the problem with throwing them in the, that sink or swim mentality is that there's a pretty high potential that some of your leaders will drown, some of your good leaders. So what if, you was, what if you are a new leader? What if, for that matter, you're an established leader and you have got to bring up the next generation of leaders? What if you had a step-by-step -step essential guide for new managers to succeed from day one? Well, stay tuned because that's exactly where we're going on this show. You see, our guest is Peter Economy. 
He is a Wall Street Journal best-selling business author, ghostwriter, developmental editor, publishing consultant with more than 100 books to his credit and more than 3 million copies sold. In addition to that, he's the leadership guy for Inc.com. Peter Economy spent the best part of two decades <sighs> slugging it out in the management trenches. He is also today the author of What? I'm the Boss? The Essential Guide to New Managers to Succeed from Day One. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me welcome Mr. Peter Economy! Welcome, sir. Oh, thank you. That was quite an intro. I'm excited. <laughs> You're excited to hear from this guy, Peter Economy, right? I want to hear, I want to hear what that guy's got to say. <laughs> well, as always, we like to start the same place, Peter, and that is in a world full of influences and all these kind of uh, people who are considered authorities, who might who might we not know? Who is it somebody we may never even considered who has been a major influence on you and your leadership? Well, one of my largest influences, my greatest influence was a guy named Bob Nelson, Dr. Bob Nelson. Um, he's a long-term friend of mine, but he wrote a book called A Thousand and One Ways to Reward Employees. And um, it's it's a guide to, I mean, it's, it's more than a thousand and one ways to reward employees, but he was really influential on me. Um, he's got a saying that uh, he says, it's, uh, you get what you reward. And I think that managers don't really think about that. They don't think about what they are, you know, how they're rewarding their employees. And they're wondering why they, they act in certain ways, the behaviors they get out of their employees. And if they actually look at what they're doing to reward their employees for those behaviors, they'll figure it out. That is very interesting, isn't it? You get what you reward, you know, and it's interesting to me because one of the things that in my work in, in uh, even in my last book, Fiercely Loyal, I talked about um, how important reward is, but also how important reward is subjectively, meaning you can't generically reward. Right. So you can't just, and that's why I like the idea of a thousand and one ways, because if you generically reward, well, we're giving everybody a $20 um, Starbucks card. Well, what if I don't drink coffee or I don't, I don't like Starbucks? Um, or we're giving everybody tickets to the game. Well, what if I don't like the game? And so it's, 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 it's very important to not only reward, but to subjectively find out what matters to that person in the reward. That's, that's a great input. Thank you. No, exactly. And that's one of the things that Bob points out is you need to ask your people what they want. I mean, if, exactly. if you want, if you want them to do the things you're hoping they'll do, find out what motivates them. You know, you might have to ask them. <laughs> you might yeah, have to communicate. That, that, that's a really crazy thought. You might have to yeah. ask them. Might have wow. to actually ask. Communication yeah. with your employees. Wow, you're on the cutting edge there, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so your new book is called Wait, I'm the Boss. Um, it's written as a guide for new managers, so they're not fumbling their way through. Um, this is something you had direct experience with back in your corporate days. Uh, you had told me that you went from managing, I think you said it was four or five people to about 400 people overnight. Talk to us about that experience of not knowing what the hell to do yeah. and getting thrown in the deep end and maybe potentially drafting. Yeah, that was quite an experience. It's been years ago, but um, I, I started out, you know, working for a company where I did, I managed a few people initially, I think I went up to a group of maybe 10 people. And then I switched jobs. And all of a sudden, I was managing 400 people. And I honestly had no idea what I was doing. I mean, um, I had not been ever trained in management, had never gone to a class. The only, only way I had to learn management by, was by watching my own boss and watching other managers in my organization. Mm -hmm. And some of them were good, you know, some of them were great managers, but a lot of them weren't so great. And unfortunately, as, as you mentioned, um, you know, Gallup has found that um, bad bosses are the number one reason why people leave their jobs. People leave bad bosses, not bad companies. They leave bad bosses. Yep. So um, I, so many people and myself included had only the example of other bosses to look at. I had never been trained in it. I, I honestly floundered. Um, I learned I was not a great manager. I did the best I could, 
Um, but I got fired. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I got fired after about a year. And, so uh, do you think you were fired because, because you just had no foundation because nobody had bothered to, to show you? I think that was certainly part of it. I mean, I, I was thrown in the deep end. And, and it was a sink or swim situation. And I, mm -hmm. I honestly sank. I mean, I, I did not swim very well. I think I, I paddled, you know, I, I, I treaded water uh, for as long as I could. And then I just started sinking. And uh, my, my boss, the, the uh, CEO of the company looked at me and he said, you know, I think we're just going to let you, let you go. <laughs> but you know, what, what's fascinating about that for me, Peter, is how, I mean, of course, that's a massive jump, four or five people to 400 plus people. But at the same time, that's like me firing the guy who came in as the dishwasher, firing him as the chef. I right. mean, it, it doesn't make any sense um, because there's no consideration of, were you prepared for this? Do you think, I mean, from what you're seeing, is that still the challenge? I mean, I know you wrote this book for help new, new leaders. Is yeah. that still what's happening? People are just getting thrown in the deep end. Who yeah. could have potentially be phenomenal leaders if they had the right training. Exactly. And, and I think that it still is. I mean, I know it's going on. I mean, there's been plenty of research about it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jack Zenger, um, Zenger Folkman, yep. he did some research on this, found out that, um, you know, most managers don't get their formal management training until they're about 42 years old. That's at right. The earliest. I mean, on, on average, that's where it's at 42 years old. So many of these people, I mean, I was a, a manager at age, I think, you know, before I was 30, I was a manager. Right. And I went many years without any training at all. And I, I, I eventually left management, became a writer before I, <laughs> before I got around to the training part. Um, you know, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics has found that uh, companies under 100 employees, they only give their managers 24 minutes of training a year. 24 minutes. 24 Com minutes. Yeah, 24 minutes. Well, that's and enough, surely. <laughs> yeah, and companies over 500 are only giving their employees um, 12 minutes a year. Oh, well, of course. It's easy. Then. <laughs> it's, yeah. Now, I think there's an exception. You know, certainly uh, many Fortune 500 companies have, have leadership tracks. I mean, obviously, IBM yes, has a well-established leadership program. They pick out, you know, promising leaders. They train the hell out of them, and they send them out around the world, and they learn leadership in different positions as they rise through the organization. But it's, but, in, it's interesting, Peter, because, and, and I know you're going to this in the book, because when we talk about leadership training so often, it is um, strategic, it is tactical, but it's not human. Right. A, a, and so when people say, I've had leadership training, have you, or have you had management training? You know, because management is about getting stuff done and making sure that your people do the stuff that needs to get done. Leadership is inspiring your people. It's, it's engaging your people so that they don't have to, they want to, which is a vastly different thing. And, and you know, your book lays that out very clearly that there is a distinction there. Talk to us a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, it's interesting because yes, management is the science, the art and science of getting things done through other people. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, when you're a manager, that's your job. Um, yep. There's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, we talked about motivation a little bit earlier, you know, you get what you reward. Um, but leadership is an integral part of that. I mean, there's many managers out there that who aren't, who aren't good leaders. Um, there's many leaders out there who aren't managers. Um, and anybody in an organization can be a leader. I mean, mm -hmm. you can be anywhere from the front line janitor. I mean, there's stories of these, you know, um, people who are frontline employees who are tremendous leaders. They inspire the people around them. They inspire customers. They inspire everybody. Um, they're just amazing. Um, and then there's stories of managers who don't inspire anything. I mean, they just, they don't know how to lead. Right. So um, there are two separate things there. I think any manager can learn to be a great leader, um, but you have to learn it. You have to learn the skills. There are skills. And, and uh, any, any great leader, if they want to become a manager, can do that too. Right. So the, you know, the subtitle of the book is The Essential Guide for New Managers to Succeed from Day One. So I would like to sort of 
break that up a little bit and let's start walking through some of the things you've outlined in the book because I think a lot of the time when we're bringing people up it's like where do I start and and where people end up starting is in again in the management you know check the box thing but that you know talk to us about what your guidance is around this so that people can really sort of begin to grasp these are the essentials, mate, because it is the essential guide. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I think the essentials, because you're right, management is about checking the boxes. Management mm-hmm. is, are, is a set of skills that, you know, so for example, you might be the best salesman in the world, best saleswoman, best salesperson in the world. And all of a sudden you get promoted into being a, a sales manager. Um, now, we have, now we have the piece of principle. Yeah, exactly. You've got the not, the, not the Peter economy, but the Peter principle. Got it. Yeah. So you've got those skills. I mean, you're a great salesperson, but you don't you haven't you don't have those management skills. And so, you know, in, in my mind, the, the things I've found, I mean, I've done I've been writing these books for a million years. Um, you know, I wrote Managing for Dummies back in 1996 or something. And, and you know, management and leadership haven't changed all that much. I think you mentioned that early on, mm-hmm. that these are kind of age old principles. There's nothing really new here. Um, but, but what I've found, you know, looking through everything I've done over the, the past, you know, years, looking at other people's work, I've, I've done a lot of work in leadership. Um, some of the most important things we hear it all the time is empower, you know, empowering your, your people and letting them do what they need to do to do their job. So, you know, your frontline employees know better than you do as a manager often, what really, what customers want, what customers are looking for, um, what problems customers have, what needs to be addressed, what their needs are. So you need to empower your people to do their jobs and quit getting in their way. So I know when I was a manager um, back in the old days, um, when I would have something I needed to get done, I, I'd think about it. I'd think, now, should I give this to my employee, um, Susan? Should I give this to Susan or should I do it myself? And I'd often go through this thought process that, well, if I give it to Susan, it's going to be, it's going to take longer. I'm going to have to teach her how to do it. It may get done wrong. Um, my customer may, may get mad. Um, there was all these negatives I, I brought yep. up in my own mind to delegate, you know, delegating this authority or this task. And then I think, well, if I do it myself, yeah, it'll take me a little while, but I'll do it faster. I'll do it better. I'll, I'll get it right. My customer will be happy. Um, so I, I would often just do it myself. Mm-hmm. That was a huge mistake. Huge mistake. Yeah. You know, first of all, I don't have, I didn't have all the time in the world to do everybody else's work. I shouldn't have been doing everybody else's work. And they weren't learning what they needed to learn to do their jobs effectively um, or to rise up in the organization, you know, to, to progress. And what you're talking about is a very common problem, um, uh, particularly for a new leader. Like if I'm put into the role, um, I want, you know, I think that part of, you know, 74% of people in leadership positions suffer from some level of imposter syndrome. Right. So if I'm in the role and I hand it off, does that mean that I'm telling them I can't do it? So I've got to do it so I can prove I can do it. And now I'm very inefficient. Right. So, you know, there's, there's the inefficiency of it. Then there's the leader who, as you just said, does know how to do it, but doesn't know how to delegate because they're afraid of loss of time, as you talked about, and loss of it looking bad on them as a reflection. Okay. So now we've got problems. What are some of the solutions? I mean, it's one thing to say, well, you need to delegate. Okay, but I don't know how to delegate. I don't know what to do with that. Um, uh, uh, okay, you feel like an imposter. Stop. Right. <laughs> you know, right. that, that's not, you know, what, I'm trying to remember the name of that fabulous American comedian from years ago who's pretended to be a therapist. And he said, you know, what do you have? I have a fear of small spaces. Well, stop it or I'll lock you in a box. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's becoming aware. I mean, I think that it's one of the most difficult problems I think managers face is delegating work, um, and, and it's 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 a combination of management and leadership. Mm-hmm. I mean, because you get more work done through others by mm-hmm. giving people the work. I mean, 
that's again, that's the definition of management is getting work done through others. Mm -hmm. If you do all the work, you're not being an effective manager, it's just that simple. So you've got to become aware of that. You've got to, you, and maybe your boss is going to make you aware of it. I mean, there's a good chance that at some point your boss is going to say, Hey, you know, why, why are you guys so inefficient? Why are these things taking so long? Why are your people sitting around twiddling their thumbs, you know, mm -hmm. getting complaints from some of these people that they're not learning, that they're not progressing in the organization? Why is this? Um, I think it's becoming aware, you, know, you have to be aware of, of how much more effective you will be as a manager, as a leader, by, you know, empowering your people by giving them the work by teaching them how to do the work holding them accountable for doing the work, you know, setting standards, and then setting them free, setting them, setting them loose. Okay, so let's talk about dealing with that. So um, you've decided you're going to delegate, you're going right. to trust your people, they're going to do it. Um, they make a dog's breakfast of it. <laughs> and you've got to now now you're frustrated because you've lost time. You've got to make corrections. Um, you know, this is a, like I said, this is a, a foundational book for new leaders. Right. So how do we, how does the, how do you recommend that the new leader deals with that? Yeah. You know, you know, what have you laid out in the book there for people to understand? This is how you deal with that. Yeah. Well, clearly the first question is, have you delegated effectively? So, you know, in the book, I, I talk about delegation, here's how you delegate, you know, you communicate what you want done, clearly, you give context to what you want done, you explain the big picture, you say, here's why we're doing what we're, we're doing. Um, here's the context and why we're doing this. So you answer the employee's question, why are, why should we bother doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, you agree on standards, you agree on exactly what you expect, and, and what what success looks like. This is what success looks like. If you, you know, sign 50 new clients this month, that's success. You know, you set a standard uh, and you agree on it. You make sure that they agree on it also, that you're not just, you know, demanding this and they don't agree. You have to have agreement there. And then you've got to give the authority. You've actually got to give them the authority to do what they need to do. And then you support them. You've actually got to make sure you support them, provide them the, with, the, with the resources they need. If they've got questions, you're there to you have an open door to help them. You know, you may talk them through scenarios you've had with your customers before. And you've got to get their co commitment. You've got to have their commitment. So the first question is, did you delegate effectively? Mm -hmm. Those are the steps you need to go through to delegate effectively. If you've delegated effectively, and they've made, like you said, dogs breakfast of, of, of it. So the question is, did they, you know, was it, were they not trained enough? Did they not know what to do? Um, make sure they've got the proper training, make sure they they know exactly what to do. Are they afraid? I mean, what is it exactly? Why did they not do it correctly? You've delegated effectively. What is missing? motivation? Are they not motivated? Are you rewarding some other behavior that um, they're, they're then, you know, performing? Um, what exactly is the problem? And then deal with that individually. If, if they're not, if they don't have enough training, get them trained. If they're, I'm sorry, go ahead. But um, no, no, I was going to say uh, that it, what, you know, what, what it boils down to here is so basic and essential that I think it's often missed. And that is number one, clarity, right? If you're going to lead, you have to have clarity about what it is you're leading to mm -hmm. and from. So here's what we are working towards. This is where we're coming away from. This is how we need to get it. As you said, the standards, absolute clarity around that. And then the next piece, because inevitably there will be a dog's breakfast at some point made out of something. And, you know, it's particularly if we're feeling um, under pressure, it's very easy to get dismissive. It's very easy to go, oh, forget it and get mad or upset. And the, the problem is oftentimes that person doesn't know why. And so, you know, your point here was, are you asking questions? Are you bothering to find out 
what was the problem? What was in the way? What did you need more coaching? Did you need more training? Did you need more examples? Is the way that I'm communicating with you work for you? Because maybe you have a different style of learning. And these are really important, again, essential, basic. You got to have them. And we're always looking for these new fangled AI, who this is the cool thing this week things. And I think that so often it comes down to these essentials, these basics of like, do you know what you're doing? Do you feel you have the authority to do it? Do you know you can ask for help along the way? And if it didn't turn out the way that you thought or I thought or the way the standard was, do you know what was missing? What did you require? What was the training that you needed or the coaching you needed? Or and maybe it was, and I think that one of the great mistakes of training oftentimes is that we train someone and we expect them to know, to know it. Right. That is dumb. <laughs> that is dumb. I don't know about you, but I certainly know for me, there are things that I can very quickly naturally pick up. Sure. And the other things that I am a dumbass at. <laughs> and I probably need to walk through the experience 10, 12 times. Not because I'm dumb. It's just because that's not my area. And so I, I can, once I've done it, a, you know, a multiple times, I'm like, oh, okay, I got it. Now it's a second nature. And I think that we look at people and we want to categorize them. Oh, this is a quick learner. This is a slow learner. And instead of saying, this is a quick learner in this area. And now I'm giving them something that's a little off that they may not be as quick. Right. And exactly. that, so I think that that willingness to have patience was, which is a rare, <laughs> a, a rare characteristic a lot of the time for leaders under pressure to bring up another leader. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, um, you know, I think that I see that so often. I mean, I saw it when I was a manager, I saw it in organizations I worked in where someone would fly off the handle because someone didn't follow through, didn't do it correctly, whatever. They made a mistake, they failed. Mm -hmm. And of course, that person, whoever that was, is going to pull back. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to become less engaged. They're going to take less risks. Yep. They're just going to, you know, kind of go into the fetal position and, and hope you don't hit them again, you know, with something. So, yep. um, you know, one of the things I talk to a lot, oh, I do a lot of work with um, technology people nowadays, um, product mm -hmm. development people. And we talk a lot about creating an environment that's safe to fail, you know, where, where you can make mistakes, but you learn from them. I mean, that's yes. the whole point is you experiment often, you experiment rapidly, and, and you get your, in, your, your data from those experiments, and, and often they're failures, but often they're successes too. And you keep progressing, you keep learning. So the key, uh, you know, being a manager, being a new manager, um, and working with people is making sure that you're trying new things, um, your people feel safe to try new things. And if they do fail, that they learn. Yes. And that's all you can expect is that they learn. And, and I think you mentioned something earlier that kind of um, got me going too, was that some, everyone's different. We're all different. We all have a different expertise. Yep. Um, I, I'm good at, I'm not good at math. I'm, I'm a really bad math guy. I was pre-med in college. <laughs> and after I got a C minus in organic chemistry, um, then a C plus in inorganic chemistry, um, and, and I got the very first test I took in college, I got a 16 out of 100. And that was in calculus and probability. I quickly realized I'm not, a, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a quantitative guy that just that's not so I, I, I left the pre med thing behind. And you know, today I'm a writer, it's a long story in between. But I'm a qualitative guy. That's my thing. And as a manager, you got to realize what your people's strengths and weaknesses are. You know, where are people stronger? Put your people in the areas where they're strong. Don't try to fit them into a, you know, a round peg into a square hole. If that person is not suited to be a numbers person, don't put them in accounting. You know, if that person is, 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 you know, whatever, you know, I can go on and on about that. But, but the other part of that is also, as we were talking about before about the, the Peter principle, meaning, you know, you've got a person who's phenomenal at sales. They're amazing. They're, they're knocking out of the park. 
that are natural. Don't assume they can train somebody else. Exactly. It doesn't mean they're a trainer. But they're yeah. so good, they could teach other people. No, they're so good, and it is probably unconscious, mm -hmm. meaning it's so second nature to them, they don't think about it. And so trying to teach somebody else doesn't work for them. Now, there are people who are great teachers and terrible at doing. Right. Right? I know some salespeople who are phenomenal sales teachers. Mm -hmm. They're terrible at sales. Right. So it's one thing doesn't naturally transfer to the other. And that's on us as leaders bringing up the next level of leaders to say, let's find out because I want to push my people out of their comfort zone. Of course, I want to stretch them. I want to make them grow. Right. But I don't want to push them so far out that they're in the middle of the desert with, without a drink of water and feeling like, oh my God, I'm going to die out here. I don't know what to do. And there's no one, no resource. Right. And I think that a lot of the times we, we, we go, oh, you've got this potential. And I have talked a lot about that. I think potential is dangerous uh, because you see it in someone else and it may not be what they see in themselves or they may be seeing themselves and have no interest. Exactly. <laughs> like, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, I think one of the fundamental problems is that many organizations have one track to rise up through the organization to get you yes. know, promoted, to get promoted, to get paid more. And that's the management track. Mm -hmm. So naturally you go from being a salesperson to being a sales manager or assistant mm -hmm. sales manager and eventually sales manager and VP of sales and all this, you know, you just keep rising up. Um, the organizations I worked in in the past, technology organizations, we realized that you need to have two tracks. You need to have a management track and you need to have a technical track. Mm -hmm. So let your sale, your best salespeople remain salespeople. Let them be the best salespeople in the world. Don't promote them into promote them into sales management. You know, let them be the best salesperson in the world forever and bring in those sales, be happy, making the commissions, all that kind of stuff. Um, we had scientists working for our company. Let your scientists be the, the best scientists in the world. Don't turn them into managers because then they're going to fail. They don't want to be managers. These certain, some of them do, but most of them didn't. They just wanted to do science stuff. They wanted to yep. research. They wanted to crunch numbers, all that kind of stuff. Don't, again, don't put that square peg in a round hole or a round peg in a square hole. Well, let's talk a little bit about that from a personal experience because, you know, um, 2020 has been a a year that's <laughs> through through most people off right yeah. um in some way many people were left questioning their careers um their investment in that their in in the career they've been on their investment in the identity of who they are in that uh and you were a corporate guy for many years and then you got laid off and in fact it was a springboard for you to do what was kind of a, a, I guess would be called a side hustle now right. that actually was your path. Talk to us a little bit about, about that journey, because I think it's, I, I am, I don't think I'm guessing wildly to say that there's a lot of people in our audience who are maybe going through some of those questions are going, you know, I've been putting in the 65 hours a week for the last 15 years. I've r risen through the organization yeah, I'm good at this. Yeah, I'm I make I made good money, but I've actually rethought my life in this. So it was about that part for you, because that was obviously a very important journey for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I said, I think it was in my twenties I became a manager and you know, progressed up the management chain, became a VP eventually, you know, VP of operations kind of thing. And was working different jobs um, as a manager um, mm -hmm. operations. So in charge of uh, all the administrative functions of an organization from uh, human resources to accounting, to uh, contracts and purchasing, to facilities, security, all these different things. Right. And I was motoring along just fine doing that. So that was my, my main career. I figured I'd do that forever. But somewhere along the line, in fact, my friend, Bob Nelson, back to Bob Nelson again, uh, somewhere along the line in the mid 90s, he asked me, would you like to write a book? Um, I said, why would I want to write a book? Why? What? That's not what I do. I'm not a writer. I'm a manager. 
Well, um, I want to do a book um, called um, Negotiate, on a, a book about negotiation for a, um, Scott Forsman. Uh, he was an editor there at the time. And well, I don't know. I still don't know why I'd want to do it. He said, well, we'll pay you like $5,000. And, and I was like, okay, you know, mid nineties, 5,000 bucks. Sure. That sounds great. Let's do this. Right. So I wrote that book and I, and it was published and it did well. I was called negotiating to win. That was my very first book. And I figured I checked the box. I, you know, my bucket list was full as far as books went. I'd never have to do that again. It was kind of fun. And then I did another book or two, worked on some other books. And eventually I started writing books essentially full time, but at night. So I was working full time as a manager during the day um, at lunch and at night after I tucked my wife into bed, I'd go off to coffee houses and write books and built this business, you know, built this side hustle, writing books and writing articles and doing all kinds of you know, business writing, basically leadership mm -hmm. writing. And so one day at work, um, my boss called myself and 15 other managers in and said, you're all going to be laid off. We're out of funding. Our funding has been cut. Mm -hmm. We're going to need to lay, lay you folks off. And I, I, I was thinking to myself, well, okay, that's not too bad. I've got this other full-time job going, writing books. I'll just do more of that. Sure. I'll, be, I'll be fine. So I got a call the next day and it was my, my boss, my old boss saying, uh, we found six months more money, come on back. And uh, six months more money. I said, No, I think I'm just going to keep doing the writing thing. And it's been more than 20 years now I've been doing writing full time and have never looked back really. It's been a big roller coaster. But there you go. I'm sure. But you, you know, you talked about being a manager being asked to write this book with your mate, with Bob. Um, had you done any writing before that? No. So um, why would he ask you to write a book? Because I was an expert in negotiation. So it was specifically a book on negotiation. And I was the guy he knew who was a expert negotiator. That's what um, when I first got out of college, I worked for the, the government, the federal government here um, as a contract negotiator. That was my job. So All I was, right. I was pretty good at it. So it was around your expertise. Exactly. So when did you sort of feel like that you know the writing was your thing right. you know because you've written a lot of books you've been you know i think it's you said over 100 books you've part yeah. of right so some of them are under your own name some of them are under other names some of them are under your name and other names right but you know writing most people even you know i'm sure there's some leaders listening going i'd love to write a book but gee you know that's so much work i can't do that you know, and they use people like you or a ghostwriter, exactly. and that's yeah. fine. And we yeah. understand that. But what I'm talking about is this. Uh, when did you come to that point of going, this happens for me? I, like, I'm good at this. It's a flow. I, I feel good in it. Yeah. Well, maybe you didn't get to that. <laughs> maybe you no, I, I, I definitely <laughs> got to that. And I, I think I felt that for the first time. I, I worked on this book again. This is turning into the Bob Nelson show. Exactly. But, you know, Bob, Bob Nelson <laughs> promo show. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bob came to me, um, you know, I, my, my first book was published in 1990, Negotiating mm -hmm. to Win. Around 94, 95, he came to me and said, oh, let's do a book about business writing. And let's, let's pitch it to the dummies guys. Let's pitch business writing for dummies to the dummies press. They had just started up. They were just writing, you know, doing some initial books. I think DOS for dummies and maybe right. Windows for dummies. And they were just starting to do business books. So mm -hmm. back in the mid nineties. And uh, so we pitched it to, to the uh, company and they said, no, why don't you do managing for dummies? Because we think that would be an A, a list book that would sell like maybe more than a hundred thousand copies yeah. and business writing for dummies would be a B list book that won't sell as many copies. So we said, okay, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, sure. We'll do managing for dummies. And it was during the course of writing that book where I, I really, it was like a 400 page book. I mean, that was like a lot of writing. And yeah. I did most of the writing on that book. You know, Bob was more the thought leader guy and I was more the writing grunt guy. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where I really felt in the groove where I really felt like this is something I could do um, for the rest of my life. And indeed, you know, that, that book sold actually more than 600,000 copies over its lifetime. And it's like in 20 something different languages, um, just 
went 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 crazy. But at that point, I realized this is something I could do. But it took getting getting laid off. It took get that layoff to give me the kick in the pants to really embrace it and say, yeah, this is something I'm going to do. And I've done it ever since. Yeah. And as I said, because I think that COVID uh, may have been for many people a that boot in the ass that they right. need um to follow their thing and i'm not saying necessarily it's writing it could be anything well that's true i I'm realize gonna... i'm you know i want to be a chef yeah well my daughter um she was working for a photographer up in in berkeley california she was my daughter's a filmmaker and she's in her her mid-20s but she was working for a photographer up in berkeley a nationally renowned photographer does a lot of photography than new york times and different magazines and stuff and she got late when COVID hit she got laid off. Yep. And exactly what you just said, she had to sort of step back and decide what am I going to do? So she just embraced even more, more fiercely this documentary filmmaking. And that's what she's doing now. Um, all the time. She's just she's applying for grants. She's out hustling money, you know, and she's making it work. That's fabulous. It really is. So when you you know, you've written all these books on on business and management and leadership and all the rest of it. When you come to all that, there must have been some form of, I imagine, it's not saying it's true. I imagine there was some form of distillation um, from all those that came into this book, yeah. right? You know, which is, you know, is written as a question. What? I'm the boss? <laughs> it's like... Uh, uh, you know, that panic moment. So I imagine it came as a distillation of a lot of the things you'd written about before. Right. If you were sort of, um, as you were break, how did you break that down? How did you decide this is the essentials? This is maybe mid-level or advanced? Yeah, well, a lot of it is just from my own experience. I mean, mm -hmm. what were the things that I was missing Right. when I became a manager, and what were the things I wasn't taught, you know, and, and I, I've written so many different articles on on leadership, you know, again, inc.com, I've written over 1500 articles on on mostly on management leadership. And I get so much feedback from these articles, you know, people would come back to me and say, here, here's something that happened to me. Uh, and I, I, I learned, you know, I, I kept learning from from people's feedback, people telling me their stories. And, and working with so many different people um, on the books I work on, these different CEOs and so forth that I've worked with. So, um, but the biggest thing to me were the, were the things that I knew I, I was missing and that mm -hmm. I lacked. And, and that's what I, I wanted to put into this book. You know, I wanted to make sure that everything that, that I, I should have been taught to be a successful manager, which I was not taught, was in this book. Right. So... Was there a um, was there a turning point for you in your in your own life? Um, what I mean by that is, you know, you've described this moment of getting laid off and becoming a writer, but was there a turning point in the in your philosophy about about leadership? Because I know, because I've written many books myself, not even close to the yeah. number you have. Um, however. I know that there's an evolution to each of those. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes there's something that comes along and sort of makes you go, Shh, actually, you need to change direction here around. And it's philosophical. Was there a moment like that that shifted your philosophy? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me was, you know, when I was a manager, um, the philosophy back then was you don't become friends with your employees. You know, you keep this kind of distance This you, you don't build a relationship, you know, it, it's a work relationship. It's not a friendship or, you know, kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it, it's not a personal relationship. It's a work relationship. And, and to me, that was one of the big turning points that I saw in management uh, later. And as I've been writing about it and mm -hmm. leadership, is that no, the most important thing you can do is build relationships, you know, and, 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 and call them friendships, call it being a family. You know, I, I've seen this, you know, written about and, and talked about many different ways. But I think the biggest mistake I made as a manager was was listening to this, you've got us, you know, yep. 
stay back. You can't have, a, you know, you, it's this relation, this, this business relationship. And, and that to me was, was a failure. Uh, I think that the, the best managers, the best leaders, and it's, it's inspiring people. It's, 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 it's become, it's, it's getting to know those people as individuals, getting to know what their lives, what they're going through, what their aspirations are, what their hopes are. And, and meeting them there, you know, meeting them there. Yeah, I think it's so important what you just said, because I can remember when I started being, it was enforced upon me. Um, listen, I know you're a friendly guy, but that, that's not your place, right? It, you know, it's not your place. You got to keep this, this professional distance, I think it was called back in those days. Yeah. You got to keep a professional distance. And um, I remember reading, um, M. Scott Peck's book, The Road Less Traveled, right. 147 years ago. <laughs> and, um, and I remember reading that book and, and, you know, this is a military psychiatrist. So that's about as distant as you can get, you know, from interacting at a very personal level. And in the book, he wrote about falling in love with his patients. And he said he was indoctrinated that he was not just supposed to get personally involved. And he said, how can I assist you? How can I serve you if I don't love you? Right. And I went, wow, that, that I remember that line standing out to me and going, that is why I am good at what I do is I fall in love with my people. I love them enough to say, piss off you're in the wrong place <laughs> and 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 i'm love you enough to let you go or i love you and i'm going to keep holding this vision of you until you can carry it right and i think that that is what it really is that we're we, that's the greatest failing yeah i think it's interesting you bring that up the l word you know love yeah and, and that's something that um the former ford ceo alan malali you know, he used to be CEO of Bo Boeing aircraft, I think, and then he became CEO of, of Ford, um, immensely successful there. And he talks about that. He talks about love. He talks about how you need to love your people, you know, and it, it, it's, it, and it's obviously, it's not a romantic love. It's, it's, it's no. really, it's, it's caring for your people, actually really caring about them just as you'd care for anybody else you love. And like you said, Loving them enough to telling them, telling them in the wrong place or in the wrong job, they should be somewhere else, you know, or loving them enough to support them, to train them, to help them rise, you know, to bring them up in the organization or just to lift them, you know, uplift them instead of beating them down all the time. Absolutely. Now, as we sort of wind towards the end of the show, I want to know about, like, you know, you talked before about working full-time as a manager then, and working full-time as a writer at the same time. Right. And we are, and that was before the world we live in today, right. when, when people had it, when people believed in 40 hour work weeks back in those days. Mm -hmm. um, and most people don't work that now they work much longer hours. Um, do, do you consider yourself a workaholic? Uh, yes, definitely. But what I, and I've, I've, I've thought about this many times, and I've talked about it many times, is that I work far ha harder, far more hours for myself than I ever worked for anybody else. You know, when I was working um, my management job, I was, you know, punching the clock, 40 hours a week, basically. Sure. Maybe sometimes a little more, but basically it was a 40 hour week. You know, I'm, my clients know I'm up at uh, till two or three in the morning, but I work at this schedule that I cho I've i chosen. You know, I work right. for a little bit in the morning, I knock off for a while, I work in the afternoon for a little while, I knock off for a while, I watch TV with my wife, you know, knock off for a while, and I work till two or three in the morning. So I, I'm sure I'm working at least double or more, sometimes much more because I'll pull all, all nighters while I'm trying to meet a, a book deadline. Uh, still do. Um, and as I mentioned to you earlier, I just turned 65. And I, I'm sitting here going, I'm nowhere near retirement. I'm still loving what I do. I mean, I love this. I love writing. I love meeting the, the amazing people that I work with. Yeah. I just I'm learning so much and just meeting amazing people all the time. So I'm just so blessed, honestly blessed to do what I do. And I, I'm in, I'm a workaholic, but I'm, I'm, I'm very much happy to be a workaholic. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is, uh, I psychologically from, you know, from my stuff or my psychology stuff, but I think there's a dis distinction in what you're talking about, 
the uh, workaholics the way I describe them. If you're a workaholic, you're so identified with the work that you think you are it and it is you. Therefore, um, it is actually externally referenced. It's the applause you get, it's the recognition you get for it. Whereas being um, somebody who is in love with their work, who is every day is bliss, you work those crazy hours, not because you it's identifiable to the world, but because you can't not. Exactly. Like, so one of my friends said, you know, do you think you're a workaholic? And I go, no. And he goes, well, do you know how much you work? I go, of course I do. And he goes, but isn't that a workaholic? And I said, no, because I don't care if it's for anybody else. I do it because I am full and I have to, ex I have to get this out to make more room. There's right. just this constant need to express that's so vital. Well, I've got to thank you because I've always described myself as a workaholic. And now I understand that there is a difference because I do love, I, I'm in love with what I do. Yeah, I, I was meant to be a writer. I was meant to to write books and write articles and, and do what I do. That was that's my purpose. Right. And I'm fulfilling my purpose. I'm not you're right. I'm not a workaholic. I'm, I'm in love with what I do. Yeah. And a, and a workaholic is never about purpose. It's about external external recognition. Whereas when somebody is purpose driven, it's it's like, I just have to do it. This right. is this is who I am. Yeah, it's fabulous. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that, Peter. But as we close up, um, two things. Uh, one is I always like to ask my guests to tell us, tell our audience where they can find out more about you, your books, your and all those resources. But before we do that, we always like to go to what is one piece of practical advice that you would like to deliver to our audience in the context of what we've talked about? that is going to allow them to really get it and put it in action, preferably within 24 hours, but certainly within the next little while that they can actually go and say, okay, go do this. And this will allow you to get what it is that Peter Economy has been talking about. Yeah. If there's just one thing I'd say, it, it's, it's reach out to all of your people and talk to them, you know, talk, communicate reach out and touch someone. And that's the old, uh, there was an old uh, telephone ad back years yeah. ago. But I think uh, so many managers fail to communicate. So reach out, um, talk to your people, see what's up, see what's going on in their lives, support them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So Peter, please tell our, our viewers and our listeners where they can find out more about you, and all the wonderful resources that you offer. Yeah, the best place to go is just petereconomy.com. That's my website. And it's got you know, links to all my Instagram and LinkedIn and inc.com where I, I write articles, everything else. It's all there. Petereconomy.com. Fabulous. Thank you. And before we finish, I want to ask you, got to ask you, what was it like growing up with a name like Economy? <laughs> because I would imagine that is a get your ass kicked kind of name. It's it's funny because there was a transition. And initially, the 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 kick my ass kind of name was Peter. It was like Peter Peter Cottontail. I got that a lot really? before before I got older, and then the economy kind of emerged as, as the as the question mark. So, but it's the one thing that I've liked about that name is people never forget it. Oh no! Absolutely. Years later, they'll say, "Don't I know you from somewhere?" Yeah, I met you like forty years ago. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. People don't forget Peter Economy. What? Is is it is it a family name? Is it is it? Yeah, my grandfather came over from Greece. He immigrated from Greece back in the early 1900s, I think, on the Lusitania ship, and his 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 name was Economou. You know, a good Greek name. Well, he be, he be, became an American at some point, and decided to adopt a good American name, which was Economy. So <laughs> that is so great. That is so. I, and you know, if you'd have gone into accounting. <laughs> You yeah, know, it's yeah. like I know numbers were not your thing, man. I got that, but that was like that 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 trade was screaming for you with that. Name. Yeah, well, it's never too late. You never know. No, Maybe I can get back no, into you, that. You found your love, man. You found <laughs> love. Stay with your love. Thank you so much, Peter. It's been a pleasure and honor having you with us. Thank you for all that you've shared, and thank you for everything that you're doing. I really, really appreciate it. And for you, dear listener, remember that you can hang out with other conscious leaders and chat about this episode 
or any of our past episodes, just finding us in our Facebook and LinkedIn groups, just go look for the Leadership and Loyalty podcast. It doesn't matter how successful you are. If your employees and your customers don't understand what gives your company meaning, you're only working at a fraction of your true capability. To find out how you can hire me, Dov Barron, as a speaker or leadership strategist for yourself or your organization, simply go to dovbaron.com. Because unified meaning, or as we call it, finding a dragon fire is the single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness for individuals and for companies. We want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how you can lift up the next generation of leaders. I'm Del Varon. I'm here to assist you tapping into your dragon fire to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.